Hi, I'm Chris Ignacio, and on behalf of the Asian Cultural Council, I'd like to welcome you to the third night of East West Fest. East West Fest is a celebration of community coming together through art, giving ourselves permission to experience and express joy, and unapologetically taking charge of our own stories. For four nights, we celebrate storytelling through words, beyond words, and through food, culminating in a discussion between ACC alumni, Pulitzer Prize winning author Viet Tan Wen, and multimedia artist Tiffany Chung. Tonight, we go behind the scenes with the founders of the latest dessert craze, Bao Nanas, and we take an intimate look into the work of Sen Chinatown Love to get a taste of how stories can be told through food. Don't forget to share your feast with us tonight by tagging Asian Cultural Council and hashtag East West Feast and tag the location where you got your food. We are so excited to gather and uplift local Asian communities during this festival and beyond. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more content. And once again, welcome to East West Fest. My name is Lloyd Arzpuaste. I am the co-founder and chief executive bear here at Bao Nanas in Jersey City. And first off, thank you so much for uh, wanting to know about my story. Uh, huge shout outs to you. And I'm truly honored to be able to talk a little bit about uh, what we do and how we got started. So Bao Nanas, we started in 2014. Uh, my yellow car, which actually happens to be here, uh, right over there. Uh, it was involved in a little uh, car accident and we needed to raise money to fix it. Uh, my girlfriend at the time and I, I am lucky enough now to call her my fiance. But we um, took to Instagram with the hashtag Bao Nanas. Uh, bao Bao meaning precious treasure in Mandarin. We're both Filipino, but it makes sense somehow. And being that we call each other Bao, um, we just thought hashtag Bao Nanas was the best way for us to spread the word on our little banana pudding fundraiser. And what we did different with banana pudding is we took our Filipino roots, we used uh, 
of Filipino dessert called Leche Flan to make uh, just this new take on banana pudding where every flavor has a light and fluffy mousse, softened wafers and fresh fruits. And it just, from the very beginning, it just kind of took off. Uh, we did this on the weekends uh, part time. We did Smorgasburg, a huge outdoor food market in Brooklyn. We wholesaled to cafes, restaurants, coffee shops, and would pop up wherever we could, mostly at things like uh, D1 functions, like Mr. or Mrs. P.I., um, any type of, uh, you know, Asian, um, you know, university group fundraisers that was available, and they invited us to come. We would always come. And, I mean, the support since we got the start has been crazy and it's been a beautiful thing and here we are seven years later with two stores in Jersey City with participation at Smorgasburg every year since 2016 uh, nationwide shipping so if you're watching this and you're, you're from somewhere far holler at us um, and the way that we've always told our story is just by really connecting with like what's in here uh, and I don't mean the microphone here, but I mean, like, what's actually in here? Uh, we always ask, what are you Baunianas for? And we try our best to deliver whatever it is that you're Baunianas for uh, to your taste buds and, and, and to your heart. And, you know, we, we do a lot of that through social media. You know, that's how we got our start. We do everything we can to really connect and be genuine uh, with our audience and with anyone that steps into our store. Um, we work with local artists to design everything. And, you know, I think if there's one thing that we can hope we can communicate to the world is that to look inside and to really think about what you are Baunianas for, what you're passionate for, who you're passionate for, who you love, what you love to do. Um, those are the things that we should be tapping into. And those are the things that I think make life really so special. And um, whether, whether you get one of our emails or just see us on social media, uh, we hope that you feel that love and we hope that you feel bananas whenever you enjoy us or whenever you uh, just happen to see us as well. And so uh, that's a wrap on this. I hope uh, this was nice. And thank you all so much once again. Much love and stay bound in is peace. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, my name is Chris Ignacio. I'm a producer with Asian Cultural Council. And today we are talking about storytelling through food. This whole event that we've been, you know, curating has been centered around storytelling through words, beyond words. And this night is going to be storytelling through food. So we have Send Chinatown Love, which is an amazing organization. And we have Marsha here from Send Chinatown Love, who is going to tell us all about how to send Chinatown Love and what it is. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marsha, for joining me tonight. Yay. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having us. It's such a pleasure to join you um, on behalf of my organization. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, and, and part of my, part of my, you know, dream with ACC is that we sort of branch out to these other networks that we've never, you know, worked with before. So I'm happy that this is probably the first touch that we've ever had. And mm -hmm. I hope that we can work together some more in the future. Definitely. Um, so Marsha, can you tell everybody who doesn't know or who might not know who Send Chinatown Love is and what you guys do? 
So Sunshine Town Love is an organization that is 100% volunteer run, and our mission is to support Asian-owned small businesses across New York City um, in whatever that means for that business. Um, early on during the pandemic, it meant fast financial relief. And so what we were doing was getting into the streets, um, calling up phone numbers for all of these storefronts that were closed, and seeing if we could help the owners um, you know, create a small landing page and raise some money for them because they were obviously closed during this time, but so many of them still had to pay rent and um, still had all of these expenses accrued just even though they were closed. Yeah. Um, but now, you know, we still do that. And now we've kind of evolved into um, doing additional types of business development or support um, for different small Asian owned businesses. Um, in addition to what I mentioned before, creating small landing pages, we also have a business development team that goes out and helps restaurant owners, you know, redo their menu. Maybe they want to um, revamp the way their Chinese menu is translated into English in a way that's more, um, you, you know, closer to the actual dish name that they intended to have in Chinese. That is something our team has helped um, folks do. Um, or let's say they sell dry goods and they want to kick off an e-commerce site, then that's also something that we have a team ready to help with. Um, so really our goal is to, you know, work very closely with these small businesses and help them digitize and learn all the possible options they have um, in the digital space to help their business. So it's 100% volunteer. Let's yes. just reiterate that. And <laughs> you're doing, it's because it sounds like you're doing so much work like on the ground actually going to these places and showing up and having conversations with these people yeah it is a hundred percent volunteer run and to be really honest with you i think at the start of the pandemic it was it, i i personally had a moment where i felt like there was so much i could do and so there was this need to share and support at no cost whatsoever um you know something that i've come to learn in doing work with these businesses is that oftentimes the only thing that's preventing them from, from getting ahead and knowing what everyone else knows is language. You know, like all of these, there's so many resources out there. Um, we saw with the PVP loan, we see it with a lot of like free digital resources that are scattered throughout, but all of these things are offered primarily in English and the agencies and organizations that offer it don't always have the most um, inclusive set of language offerings, right? Um, even within the Chinese community, they have Mandarin speakers oftentimes, but do they have Cantonese speakers? Do they have Fujonese speakers? Like those are kind of the dialects that are lacking. And um, unfortunately, a large portion of our small business community, particularly like the Chinese small business communities in New York City do speak uh, one of those two uh, dialects that aren't represented. So we are definitely very passionate about doing this work. We're willing to do this work because we think that if we love Chinatown and if we want to see these businesses that have really been such integral venues and in some of our best memories, then we want to do our part in making sure that they can, you know, make it past this pandemic. I wanted to ask you, Marsha, and you could speak for yourself or for Send Chinatown Love. How do you think that we tell stories through food? It's a really great question, right? I think when we um, when we talk about food as it pertains to Asian culture, something that a lot of my peers say is, you know, food is everyone's love language. Like Asian folks show our love through food. When we want to celebrate with family, food is always the thing that cannot go wrong. You know, everyone plans out the food. It doesn't matter where we can eat it. It could be at a park. It could be at someone's basement. As long as the food is on point, then it's a good time. Yeah. Have and you eaten means I love you. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Um, and, you know, when it comes down to storytelling through food, in my experience through Sunshine kind of Town Love, it's, it's really all about kind of like honoring what this food is and who it is that's cooking this food, right? There's so many times when you can have um, a dish that's so simple like dumplings. And when you describe it in English, it can be, it can really um, just take away from 
how significant dumplings can really be, right? So um, we work with a bunch of what I call, you know, Asian fast casual restaurants um, where you can go in, order from a menu and get your food and be out within five minutes. And they oftentimes offer the same set of items, right? They have dumplings, they have stir fried noodles. Um, and so when you hear these dish names in English, it's so easy to just assume that they must all taste the same, that they must be very similar. But in doing the work with San Chinatown Love, where we actually go and we want to meet the people who are cooking it, meet the restaurant owners, we learn that the background of the chef and the owner are so different. And it's the flavors and ingredients that they grew up with eating that really differentiate this restaurant's dumplings over another restaurant's dumplings or this restaurant's stir fry noodles over another's. And um, I think that is like the the very in interesting piece when it comes to storytelling through food. It's like understanding the nuances and how one single dish can be so different across cultures, even within a single country. That sounds like such intense work that like um, someone that really has a dedication to this community will be invested in. But if someone's just like looking for dumplings, uh, you know, how how would they happen upon a story like that? How would they get to know a place like that, you know? Yeah, you know, that's that's actually a question that we asked ourselves when we first started doing work for San Chinatown Love. Like all of these businesses, there was no such thing as like search engine optimization for any of these like cash only mom and pop shops, right? For them, they knew their business was doing well if they were getting foot traffic. But obviously COVID has really changed how much traffic they are getting by foot. And so we looked at ourselves and we we're thinking, you know, um, it's time for us to start giving these restaurants a fighting chance to tell their story online when people are Googling for dumplings in a certain region, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think um, when, we find, when we work with new businesses, what we call merchants, we oftentimes will interview the owner and do a write-up and publish it out in a web page. And so that was one thing that we aspired to kind of um, address is, you know, even though Yelp may just categorize all dumpling shops under this one search option, mm -hmm. we can create a story and like really dive into the background of this restaurant owner and publish that online. And hopefully someone will see it and be intrigued by, you know, the person and their culture before they are by the food that they're offering. But also something else that we can all, you know, chip into to do is like, if there is a local restaurant that you love and you happen to know, you know, more specifically the type of regional cuisine it represents, definitely feel free to leave a Google review and leave a Yelp review, right? Like these are all things that obviously take up our time, but as locals and as people who really want to commit to these businesses being represented adequately, we should all try to do our part in making sure that the right type of story is being told about them. Yeah, yeah, because often the people that leave these reviews are not locals, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. They're like out of towners and they're just like, oh, I found this really great place. And and then it ends up that, yeah, only tourists go there and then the locals actually don't want to go there anymore. Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, this just reminded me of another conversation I had with a friend where you sometimes you go on Yelp and you'll see people take off stars for bad service or bad decor. But, you know, we were in like this Asian owned establishment that is looking to bring cheap eats for their neighborhood, right? Like yeah. who's going to care about service and who's yeah. going to care about decor? Yeah. So it's it's like those those types of things that really motivate me to want to, you know, get on Yelp and like tell the story of this business even more because there are uh, they can be so misunderstood if you just go by what people write about them on these review platforms. And so this this web page that you publish their their stories on, where is that? So if you go on our website, um, right at the top, there's a red button that says donate. Um, if you click into that button, you'll see all of the different merchants who we work with. Um, we have hair salons. We have a lot of restaurants that spread across the boroughs. It's not just Chinatown Manhattan we're talking about here. Um, there are actually nine unofficial Chinatowns in New York City, and a lot of our businesses represent those nine neighborhoods. Um, so once you go on there, you'll see, you know, the headshots of the owners, you'll be able to read into their story, their immigration story, why they even chose to come to America. And oftentimes we even, you know, try to break it down for you to help contextualize like the size of this operation. We'll tell you how many employees are currently working there, um, what year they opened, and, uh, you know, the type of support that they're, that they're currently in need of from the community. 
That's awesome. So, so in terms of, yes, like what support they do need, um, what do you think is the best way to support them? You know, I mean, it's like, I, I think you said, mentioned something earlier that you were, you were doing, you were sort of trying to get fast money for them, but is that yeah. still considered the best way to support the restaurant? Or what That's other a good ways? question. Definitely early on in the pandemic, our goal was fast financial relief because all of these businesses were just under an immense amount of financial pressure. Businesses, you know, we saw it. if anyone went out to buy groceries just one time, you'll notice that like 80% of the shops that you normally frequent were closed. But what some people don't know is that these businesses who are closed are often still obligated to pay rent. We have this one restaurant um, in Flushing. I don't know who, if you've been in Flushing, you might be familiar with um, food courts in Flushing. Mm -hmm. They had a stall in a food court in a basement of a shopping mall yeah. and their rent every month was $10,000. And they were closed for a long time because the mall was closed, but the landlord still forced them to pay rent. So they, you know, when we first reached out to them in June, they had already owed $30,000 in rent since being closed in March. And that is just one of like many, many, many stories that our business owners have. So at the very beginning, yes, fast financial relief was a priority, but our long-term mission is to get these businesses um, in a place where they can, you know, learn about new revenue streams online and eventually integrate them into their business to a point where they can be self-sustaining and maybe, you know, use these digital tools that we're kind of guiding them through um, on their own for their own businesses. So, you know, what started off as fundraising has now evolved into um, marketing campaigns for them. You know, we try to do fundraising campaigns to show them the power of social media and just how how great the results can be when you just share your story with a wider audience. We also have a team, our business development team that works with them to do a bunch of miscellaneous tasks that they that may like enhance the overall, you know, business of the restaurant. So for example, if a bakery or restaurant wants to revitalize their menu, you know, oftentimes they go to these places and the menu looks like it was printed like 20 years ago and they still used it. So we'll go and we'll offer, you know, free redesign services. We'll see if there are better ways to even translate some of the dishes because we do know that oftentimes when you have it, an Asian dish and someone is trying to translate it into English, especially if they're not a you know, English speaker, things can get lost in translation yeah, sometimes. Yeah. So trying to bridge the gap there and seeing, you know, what is the best way that we can represent what they are offering? Um, or even, you know, tea shops, like we have a few 99 cent store-esque businesses that we work with who we are trying to, you know, set up e-commerce shops for so that they can reach a, a national audience when it comes to sharing their goods with the community. So there are so many different ways that we are trying to help the businesses and and it, it's so much deeper than financial support. It really is like ensuring that they have the resources to make it long term in, in this time, right? It's 2021. I think COVID has taught us that digital is like such a popular place for consumers to shop. So how can we get these merchants who are traditionally cash only to, you know, also enjoy what digital has to offer? Well, I... Let's say I am like a lonely, you know, ignorant dumpling eater, and I have just heard about Sun Chinatown Love, and I know that I can't do all of the free business stuff that you guys are doing and help that way. So what could I do? Just me, my poor little self eating dumplings. How can I support them? Listen, we love, we love people like that, right? Because there are um, you know, if you are a dumpling lover and you love dumplings, then continue buying them from smaller shops. I know that like Trader Joe's and Whole Foods and all these places, they carry frozen dumplings now, but um, a lot of these small dumpling shops also sell frozen dumplings on their own. And something that we've noticed yeah, is- like 60 dumplings for like 12 bucks or something. Yeah, it's an insane deal. It's insanely like affordable. Even if they're not a dumpling shop, we've noticed that like restaurants are starting to sell their own chili oil and starting to sell all of these other things on their own. So, you know, first step is to see if you can do your grocery shopping at these restaurants that you love to frequent so much. Something else that you can do that is honestly it doesn't cost money, but it may cost a few minutes of your time. It's just to, you know, get to know some of your favorite restaurants and establishments, right? Um, there are certain places that I definitely rely on heavily in my neighborhood. Like there's a place that I get steamed buns at every Saturday. There's like my dim sum place. There's also my iced milk tea place. And 
I really rely on them and making my week uh, enjoyable, but I don't always have the time to like pop in and like say hi and get to know the people who are serving me, get to know the, the owners of the store. And, you know, I think if we can all spend some time to do that, it helps these business owners feel very visible and um, present in a community that they may have been doing business in for decades. Um, and, you know, I, I'm sure they appreciate our business, but I think they would definitely appreciate knowing that we care about them and viewing them more as just a business owner, but also as an individual with a name and with an actual spot in this community. So humanizing these these restaurants that we go to, like remembering that there are people, that they have stories, that they have names and taking a few minutes to just get to know them. Yeah, exactly. That can go such a long way. And I think that's part of this, you know, if we all just we're able to put a name to a face to each business that exists in our neighborhood, then the amount of like uh, support and advocacy that just happens organically because of that um, really multiplies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other like quick pointer, like conversation starters for someone that is facing a language barrier? You know, like how do you get to know them? You know, language barrier is kind of interesting. Like something that I've started to do is I will just straight up type it in Google Translate and I will like, uh, translate it to the language and um, click on the uh, the what is it when they say it out loud yeah uh -huh. I would just like play that for the business owner and see if see what their reaction may be <laughs> yeah and I I try not to ask questions because I'm pretty sure that if they were to respond in their native language I may not understand but I have extended compliments like that like you know your dumpling is like my favorite dish or your um, like when I go to Korean restaurants, sometimes I'll say like, your stir fried, you know, spicy rice cakes are my favorite thing here. Thank you so much for making them. I love it. Just playing that for them. And I think that is like, yeah, it's kind of an endearing thing. And they're always like, they always respond with a huge smile on their face. Maybe not something that they commonly receive. That, yeah, I can tell that that would make someone feel super heard. Like, whoa, she took the time to type that out on her phone and like <laughs> yeah. at me and play it for me. Like, you know, that's, that's yeah. a big gesture. Yeah. Well, Ashley, thank you so much for, for telling us about Send Chinatown Love and for letting us get to know you a little bit. I think oh. the work you guys are doing is so cool um, and so inspiring. Like, uh, thank you for that. I feel oh. full, like after having eaten a good meal. <laughs> thank you so much, Chris. This is a great conversation um, and definitely, hopefully not our last conversation. I think it's, it's awesome to even have been reached out by you all um, just to know that we now have all these organizations that acknowledge each other and are willing to work together to to do what's best for you know our communities and obviously like our small business communities too so marcia you want to do one last plug for send china town love Yes, I love I love doing plugs for Sunshine I Love. So if you are intrigued by any of what we're doing, there's so many ways to continue your, you know, continue um, the conversation with us. Uh, first and foremost, follow us on Instagram. Our handle is Send Chinatown Love. Um, that's also our URL, sendchinatownlove.com is our website. And if you actually want to join us as a volunteer, we would love to meet you and hear from you and see what is the best way that you think you can contribute to our uh, business community, whether you're a designer or an engineer or a writer or, uh, you know, uh, you want to be a translator. There's so many different ways that you can get involved here. So um, once you get on the website, feel free to shoot us an email or you can even send us a DM once you're on our Instagram page. Cool. Thank you so much, Marsha. Yay. Thanks, All Chris. Right. You're welcome. Have a good rest of your day. You too.